Now it's quiet, so I'm sure we can hear that. Anything I need a microphone. All right. How's everyone doing? Good. 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 Woo! Excited to be here. Out with people. All right. So. Oh no, Joe. I might need a. We good here? Cool. All right. Welcome, everybody. It's good to see everyone. Thanks for coming out tonight. Woo! Woo! Welcome to our event. Um, my name is Eric. I'm one of the founders here at SEOY uh, at night. I lead our SE team at a company called Coda by day. Any Coda fans in the house? Woo! Yay! Yeah. There's probably some liars out there, but I'll take it. Uh, but it's really good to see everyone. We're excited to be here. Uh, when was it, like three months ago? We were literally right across here. So if you look across, you can see into our past, but we are in our present here. <laughs> but we're excited for the event tonight. So um, I don't know, when Akshat told me this was a topic, I was like, I don't know, should we do this? For session? Like, is this, people are gonna like this? But there's a party afterwards, so. <laughs> um, but I'm really excited for this topic. I think it's just really timely. And you know, for us in this community, it's all around like, telling people what they want to hear and, and giving the real information and you know not sugarcoating it. So I think this is going to be a great conversation tonight. This is our second event of 2022 for SENI. Woo! Um, Woo! Here's our agenda. So I'll kick us off quickly, um, talk a little bit about SENI, get into the panel, and then we're going to have an after party, which is going to be great. This is a super special event for SENI. Um, we've been doing this for, for four years now. When we started, it was just a couple people who were like, just want to have a beer with another SE, is I think how it started. For Akshat, it was a sparkling rosé. <laughs> no um, but just really excited to see how the, the community has grown, um, all the lives that have been impacted, the connections that have been made. It's just been super special. We now have over a thousand members of this community. Um, oh, yes. So just Woo. crazy to see where it's been. Woo. And, so we have a lot of people to thank real quick. Um, first, big thank you to the events team. So Ali, Anthony, Lizzie, and Andres, thank you guys so much for helping just coordinate all the events. Thanks to ourselves. <laughs> but to Akshat, who does so much for this community, he really is just rowing extra hard for us as we keep it going. So thank you, Akshat. I don't know if you were here for years, but it was just me and Ellen here. You probably got pretty lazy. Yeah. <laughs> and then we have our good friend Sam Pena, who couldn't be here today, but he is here in spirit. A uh, huge shout out to our sponsors, so Google Cloud, for some, providing this space, which is amazing. Demo Blocks, who we're going to hear from in a little bit, they're going to sponsor the after party here. And then, really, like, we talk about all the time, this community is all about everyone here and just making sure that people make connections, learn, you know spend quality time with each other, so just thank you all for coming out tonight. Um, this is where you can find us, so most of you probably signed up on Meetup. You can find us on our Slack community, we have almost a thousand people in there, uh, and also on LinkedIn, just to keep up with us socially. We are gonna have a... A, a ripper. A ripper. <laughs> <laughs> it is. Um, four years it has been uh, a long time coming, so huge thank you to Demo Blocks for helping sponsor this. Um, we have the canopy room at Jungle Bird, so we're going to be there from 7.30 to 9.30, question mark, until whatever. <laughs> um, I'm excited to check this place out, it looks really cool, so please join us there if you can after this. Um, so now what I'd like to do is welcome up our good friend Brian from Demo Blocks uh, to tell us a little bit about them. Woo! So Akshat helped me, hired me to be the hype man. Are you guys excited? Yeah. All right, so I'll open with a little personal story. It's been about 10 years since Akshat and I had the fun, the pleasure of going to EDC Las Vegas and raging out to Tiesto. So any of you wow. EDM fans out here, yes. we can talk afterwards. So, so uh, isn't this the greatest community of, of people that we have? This is the greatest role in all of IT. We are the people that drive the sales from, uh, from the beginning to fruition. And we're the ones trying to help out 
uh, deliver value for all the prospects involved. And what we do here at Demo Blocks is actually we help B2B SaaS companies deliver better demos, right? We're trying to provide realistic in-app data live into your product in real time so that you guys can demo anywhere within your product and just be guaranteed you're gonna have compelling demo data with which to wow your prospects with. And that's the core of Demo Blocks is really just helping this the people in this room save time, save effort, so you can focus on instead of plugging holes and gaps in your data inside of your product, you can focus on value self, right? That's the goal of Demo Block. So thank you, Aksha, thank you, Sunny, and let's go. Let's go. Wow. Thank you, Ryan. You did bring it. I enjoyed that. Thank you again. We'll see everyone at the canopy room at Jungle Bird after this. Um, again, we mentioned it's all about the people here, so we love doing our, our member spotlights. So tonight we're gonna spotlight Alexis. Is she here? Hi! Alexis in the back. Everyone say hi, Alexis. Hi, Alexis. Um, Alexis, just recently, how long ago was it? You got promoted? Last Monday. Last Monday? This is a fresh promotion. So Alexis is now the SE manager for LATAM Canada and the East over at Okta for one of their specialist groups. Um, I love the advice that she gave, gave. So I actually got the same advice when I went from an SE to a SE leader. And my VP was like, if you want to get promoted, just tell someone. And I was like, okay. <laughs> that seems simple enough. It's like, yeah. So there's a lot of people, especially as I've been in SE leadership, I mean, some people just don't speak up and say it. It's like, tell people, right? And then they'll help guide you there. That's part of your leadership's um, whole reason that they're there. So. Um, super excited for Alexis to join the SE Leadership crew. Um, I'm sure there's a lot of nuggets that you can share with us and you'll learn from everyone else, so congrats again. All right. All right. And she's renovating an old farmhouse in Vermont. That's exciting, I love Vermont. All right, so we're gonna kick this off. I'm gonna welcome up my good friend, Joe Malay. It's not Malay, it's Malay. Um, <laughs> And Joe, for those who don't know, uh, you know, had to jump through a couple hoops to get us inside Google's office. So, Joe, no, thank you. you're a goddamn hero. Thank you so much for setting us up. Um, so, hi, everybody. Again, my name is Joe Malays. I am a customer engineering manager at Google Cloud. Um, customer engineers, what we call our sales engineers. So, I've been at Google for two and a half years. Uh, I was an IC for about a year and a half, covering enterprise uh, media accounts in New York. And for the past uh, 13 months, I've been a manager covering predominantly venture-backed startups also in New York. So I'm um, very, very excited to be here. Very, very excited that we had such a great turnout. I want to thank uh, all the Googlers in the room that, that, that came to help. I truly, truly appreciate you. Um, before we get into the panel, because uh, we just wanted to spend about five minutes talking about the different SE roles at Google Cloud and, and, and Google more generally, because there are literally dozens uh, of different potential roles, depending on what you understand, depending on what you focus on, uh, and all sorts of stuff. So we actually have uh, somebody from recruiting who's going to dial in, and let me just give her the green light that we're waiting for, and uh, Yvonne will be joining us shortly. we will be doing a quick Q&A uh, uh, about kind of the different the different roles available at Google and, and uh, the first steps that you can take. Probably should have given her more than 15 seconds. <laughs> Joe, quick question. Yeah. Is Google hiring on the rest of the team? Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Here we go. Hey. Hey. Hey, Yvonne. Hi. Say hi to everybody. Hi. <laughs> hi. Hello. Hello. Hi everyone! <laughs> I can see my face on the projector, which is really weird. <laughs> so, so Yvonne, uh, why don't you tell us really quickly um, what you do at Google, and then we'll jump into the questions. Yeah! Um, I've been at Google here for a little over four and a half years. I sit in Seattle, Washington. Um, I mainly recruit and have mostly recruited uh, specifically in the cloud, go-to-market, customer engineering, aka sales engineering org. Um, I've done some hiring in, in solution architect roles, solution manager roles, PM roles, and sales roles, but I would say mostly I focus on sales engineering hiring. Cool. Thank you. 
Thank you so much. Uh, speaking of sales engineering, can you just, just give us a high level overview of, of the different types of SE roles uh, available at Google Cloud? Yeah. Um, so just to kind of zoom out a little bit, um, you know, within our cloud customer engineering, sales engineering org, we specifically have a verticals or industry team, and they're split up across like financial services, retail, healthcare and life sciences, along with telecommunications, media and entertainment gaming, where the sales engineering talent that we try to hire in that group, they come with some of that industry expertise. And then we have the subregions or what we call the geo team. So these are orgs that are more regionally tied with micro-region alignment in terms of customers. Um, and we, we have East, West, Central, and then we also have the corporate customer engineering team where they focus more on mid-enterprise mid to small-sized businesses. And then we have the kind of North America national team where they provide a little bit more of a technical expertise within specific domains across all vertical geos, um, have a little bit of a different compensation structure, um, but nonetheless are still sales engineers. And then of course, we have some miscellaneous uh, like Apogee app or business application platforms, sales engineering roles, uh, security focused product focused um, sales engineering roles that was formerly the Chronicle team. But yeah, that's kind of the high level overview. So what I'm, what I'm hearing from you is that we've got a combination of roles. So we've got kind of in the geos and the verticals, those are really the infrastructure of focused roles. And then we also have like more SaaS oriented roles in like, in, and we have a, a, a portfolio of SaaS products as well. So, yes. okay, yeah. very cool. Oh, and I totally forgot to mention we have SAP sales engineers as well. Okay. So, um, you know, a, it's probably about a, a dozen or so roles uh, across the, the different uh, across the different kind of groups that that are scattered throughout North America, right? Yes. So, um, and, and so, as a recruiter, when you're looking at candidates or potential candidates, kind of what kind of backgrounds typically find the most success as sales engineers in Google Cloud? And and do I need to know GCP before I apply? So. Um, the answer to the first question in terms of what types of backgrounds find success, we've seen actually quite a, a variety of different backgrounds that are not traditional pre-sales engineering backgrounds. So we have, folk, we have folks who have a very heavy consulting background and post-sales experience and maybe did a couple years of program management or product management. Um, we've got folks who have just mostly product management experience um, and somehow have been very eyes deep in the cloud space who do really well. And of course, the more typical, you know, solutions engineering, solution architects, um, solution managers, um, basically any type of role where you are kind of mastering the intersection of where engineering and technology meets business. Um, we've seen quite a variety of backgrounds who, to our surprise, um, just crush the interviews and do really well. And the, to answer your second question, GCP experience is not required. Um, I do joke around and say at least, I mean, you don't want to show up for a data analytics customer engineering interview and say, what's BigQuery? Like, you want to do some baseline homework. But um, a lot, all of our interview questions are really structured so that you can leverage any cloud platform experience you do have with Azure or AWS or IBM to demonstrate your core competencies around being able to articulate cloud and why there is value in a serverless solution. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, um, just to add a little anecdotal evidence that we really do take candidates of all backgrounds. I personally had zero sales engineering experience before uh, before I joined Google Cloud, um, I honestly didn't know what I was getting myself into. I just 
really wanted to get a job at Google. Um, but I came, but personally, I came from the customer side, right? I came from the developer background. We're constantly building, and, and that's what I find a lot of sales engineers do here. It's like they're builders, right? You're solving customer problems constantly. So if you enjoy doing that and you're good at it and you understand cloud or one of the products in our portfolio, I think you'll do well here. Uh, so thank you so much, Yvonne. And uh, one last question before we let you go. Um, what's the best way for any folks in the room to, to connect with, with Googlers and learn more about uh, available roles? Yeah, um, well, definitely being a part of a community like the sales engineers, sales engineers of New York <laughs> is one way to do it. And then there, I, I know that there are um, Googlers in the room, so definitely look around turn, and see. Turn, okay. around, turn around, everybody wave. <laughs> yeah, um, and of course the more traditional way is always to check careers.google.com, type in customer engineering or sales engineering. I did forget to mention like other transferable backgrounds um, are like technical account manager roles too. Um, but ultimately, um, I would say being really brave, leveraging LinkedIn um, is also actually a very creative way uh, to reach out to existing Googlers who are in roles that you are interested in pursuing. Even if you don't know them, um, reaching out to them and really showing up with intention and saying, hey, I would love to know how you've paved your career path within Google and into sales engineering. For so those of you who are maybe not super heavy in the cloud domain or have a lot of experience in cloud, reaching out to a Googler via LinkedIn and setting up a 15, 20 minute coffee chat and just you know, expanding your network that way is also a really good way to get some real-time connection around understanding the role. Amazing. Yeah, I, I, I think that's great advice. Like, just be bold. Um, and it gets back to what Eric opened with is, you know, if you want to get promoted, you got to ask, right? If you, if you want to get a job, you, you got to ask. You, you got to reach out to folks and, and, uh, and be bold. So I, I love that. Um, thank you so much, Yvonne, for, for joining me. Um, just so everybody knows, the Googlers in the room are, are wearing these badges. Um, we have one of Yvonne's uh, peers from, from the recruitment team in the room, as well as a couple of our sales leaders. We're all going to be available to hang out. Feel free to ask me any questions you want. Uh, very, very transparent. So um, we're here to chat about, uh, we're just here to chat with you and, 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 and help you understand what the roles are. So um, without further ado, uh, Yvonne, thank you so much for your time and uh, we're gonna jump into the next segment. Yeah, of course, thank you so much. Have a great evening. <laughs> All right, um, if you ask the panelists to come on up. Please uh, tell us <laughs> your name, where you work, what you do, and, and then most importantly, you know, what was your journey to 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 where you got where you are. Sounds great. I work for Joe. I'm Jen Dippinger. Hello, everyone. Uh, tonight I work for Joe. Ordinarily, Joe is one of our managers. He leads one of our customer engineer teams in the East. And uh, I've been with Google. I just checked two days ago. It was five years. Wow. And, uh, wow. Thank you. Would not have guessed in a million years that I would be sitting in this seat today if you would have asked me five years ago, what are you doing in five years? You know, you make those plans and all of those things. So, um, so where did I get started? I started in the help desk in college. Uh, I really loved the intersection, as Yvonne mentioned earlier, between technology and people and solving problems and helping people. You know, if you solve problems and you're nice about it, you can you can get a lot done. So I started in the help desk. Um, and then I moved over to, after college, worked in the DOD space as a contractor. 
Um, so I'm based in Virginia, actually, just outside of DC. It's kind of the lifeblood of a lot of what goes on in there. Um, and it was a fantastic ride. Uh, I, I, I was a PMP, I was a scrum master, worked in a data center. I was one of the smaller people on the team and they would always send me <laughs> under the tiles, you know, if anyone remembers, like, you know, cables under the tiles. They're like, Jen, we need to, you know, trace this cable. Okay, okay, I'm going down. I'm going down. So um, it, it, was, it was a really cool experience to learn just about you know what all goes into a data center. How do you procure things? Power, space, and cooling. All of those logistics things that I absolutely love. The organization of it. Um, so then I was uh, fortunate enough to work with a company. We were small. We played many roles, and I did everything from a scrum master to I built a team from zero to you know 300 people. So um, it's it's kind of like building a business, and I really love that entrepreneurial spirit. Um, fast forward a few years, I came over to Google. Uh, I was on the public sector team initially as an individual contributor, not a manager, um, customer engineer. And I, like Joe, come from a very non-traditional background. Didn't have sales experience. Worked with a lot of sales folks, but on the other side of the house. Um, so I'm also proof that you know you don't have to have prior um, SE or CE experience. We really look for the curiosity. You know, people who want to learn. People who are insatiable about pushing yourselves, you know, that's what we do every day. Um, so it's really awesome to be here. Thank you for inviting me and I'll pass it over. Well, thank you for having me. Um, so my name is Jacqueline Lanesa. I am a regional vice president at Zscaler. Um, also a mom of two boys and uh, they're just awesome, four and six. So how did I get here? Um, a couple things. One, I knew I wanted to be in sales. Um, I'm a people person at heart and I get energized by being around people. Um, so I don't know if anybody ever came across like those Cutco sales people that like go knock, knocking door to door. I'm like the weirdo that loved doing that. Um, so I knew that I was doing that in college and um, back then pharmaceutical sales was a really cool thing to get into. And um, there was no pharmaceutical companies at the job fair I was at. So I saw at the time it was Cisco. I said, let me just walk around, I'm all dressed up and I got some resumes, I gotta talk to somebody. So kind of going back to some of those stories about just kind of being bold, take risk, do things even if you don't think it's the right fit for you. I had at the time no intention of getting into technology. I had a business degree in finance. Um, and then I continued to go on interviews thereafter. Another you know, cool lesson, there was like nine interviews, it was very intense. Um, and I kept going on the interviews thinking, I'm just gonna do this to practice. This isn't what I really wanna do. I don't really wanna work for this company. I don't even wanna be in tech, but I gotta practice, right? So another good lesson that do things you don't think that you may wanna do because it turned out to be my career for the next 15 years. Um, so I started at Cisco in like a, what's called an associate sales program where they train recent graduates for a year. Um, now I think it's two years, but it was a year back then. They all moved down to North Carolina for people, it was 200 people at the time globally, and then they kind of ship you out back, you know, somewhere in the U.S. thereafter. So that's kind of how I got my start in tech. Um, and then from there, I spent a lot of time in different roles of individual contributor covering different size accounts, then first line leadership, second line leadership, and it was a really great place to be for a long time. And a couple years ago, um, I was looking for a little bit more innovation and agility and development and just something very different than what I was doing. And Zscaler was a really incredible company that was growing very fast and they were starting a new segment for what we call enterprise, but I would categorize it more as mid-market. And so I've spent the last couple of years building out this mid-market segment, which has been a ton of fun. So we too have been hiring a ton and uh, happy to chat with anybody. So thank you for having me. Hello everybody, my name is Andrew Hollander. I'm with AWS, so everything I say here, disclaimer, it's my own personal opinion. You know, the message from Amazon or AWS. So let me tell you my career journey. So um, in the 90s, I'm the old guy, I guess. In the 90s, when I started in technology, I was a technologist, I was an IT consultant, and the way I got into that was I started making television commercials out of college, because that's what I studied, and recognized that there was this thing called digital video happening. And I was more interested in the computers than I was in the art of the machines that became the editing machines and the digital video consoles. Um, so I kind of captured that, that wave of digitization and 
decided that I was gonna specialize in that and took my career for three years of technology consulting and then went into a dot-com bubble, dot-com company in the late 90s that became um, an entrepreneurial um, adventure that was really exciting for me. Um, and then at the end of that experience, the internet bubble popped and I said, what's missing from my career? Do I go to grad school now? And um, long and short of it was I decided to go work for a very large company. So I joined AT&T at the time and it was um, a tremendous experience because they have, a, you know, like all large companies, billions of resources at your disposal to help you learn and grow. And it was a tremendous opportunity for um, helping work with some of the largest media and entertainment customers at the first role there, and then largest financial services customers, um, and learn and travel and see the world and get to uh, transition from what started as a technical specialist, essentially an SE, um, and then moved into an individual contributor as a seller, carrying a bag and selling, and then um, I changed to a different organization and traveled uh, the globe doing global IT outsourcing with a company called BT Global Services, which has just been a part of uh, British Telecom, here in New York though, but for a British company. Uh, and then after doing that, um, I worked part-time there and was going to grad school uh, nights and weekends, which was a really interesting maneuver to work. Uh, earning and learning was always like a philosophy of mine and I was able to find a place to do both simultaneously. So that worked out really nicely. And then decided I wanted to do this thing called The Cloud 2010. I decided I was gonna go work for the Magic Quadrant Leader in Public Cloud, which was a small company called Savis. Um, and I joined that organization and wound up staying with them for about seven years through uh, mergers and acquisitions when CenturyLink, was a small telco out of Louisiana, acquired them and then grew into um, another M&A role that I took on with the level three acquisition and focused back on media entertainment customers and then recognized this opportunity to go work with AWS about three years ago um, got the call and was interested in building out this enterprise sales team. It was really a perfect fit for me and my experiences. And I said, great, let's do it. And uh, it was nice to go back to the leader in a magic quadrant for another part of my career. <laughs> Instead of competing against the book company, which was always my joke uh, back in 2010, which is no longer the case, right? So a uh, very, very unique journey there. But um, all along the way, as an individual contributor looking at um, the technology and the industry that I was specialized in and figuring out what's the right next move. Where do I wanna go, what's my passion, what's my next assignment, and being you know engaged. And I'm gonna talk a little bit, I guess, as we get into the questions, but a couple of things, as I was saying, like earning and learning, really big theme, but also the culture of your organization and your manager, right? I love the, you gotta ask if you wanna have a promotion. You know, it's also, you have to have a manager that, that you, you know, you don't work for a company, you really work for an individual, and if that individual is invested in your career and your personal development, you're gonna have a career with personal development. If you don't, you won't. So that's kind of like the, the gist of it, so. Great. Cool? All right, thank you so much. All right. uh, thank you all the panelists. And then just to give everybody a heads up, we'll try to save a few minutes at the end and take some questions from the audience. Um, without further ado, uh, Jen, I'm going to toss this one to you. You know, there's a lot of doom and gloom around. Uh, <laughs> you guys haven't been paying attention to the news. Um, and, and, and it's serious, right? But, but life goes on, right? And we need to keep moving forward. Um, and, and when we keep moving forward, like how do we keep a team morale during you know, an ec economic downturn, econo economic headwinds? Lots of doom and gloom. No, not at all. Um, so, you know, when, when we were thinking about this question, I thought, well, what have we all weathered over the past couple of years together? That has been incredible to keep teams together, right? To build bonds, to build teams when a lot of times you're not in the same room. Like, this is such an amazing luxury. How cool is this all for us to be here today? Um, you know, keeping the team together through significant headwinds, you know, whether it's a recession whether it is a pandemic, you know, uh, is really, really, really tough. And it requires excellent management to really understand, okay, I need to engage with my team, keep everyone together, um, you know, and find ways for folks to connect in non-traditional ways. Uh, we went from everyone coming into the office on the regular to everyone being in a box. You know, and now you see cats and you see kids and you see, you know, family members and maybe, you know, a, a roommate. You know, we're, we're in New York, you know, everyone has like this much space. And, you know, you, you really wind up learning a different side about people. Um, and so be in touch with that. And to your point earlier, you know, finding an amazing manager who really understands that and gives you space. Like what I would do, you know, is 
um, you know, find ways for people to connect outside of the norm. Hey, this is not a forecast call. We're going to come together. We're not going to talk about anything business. You know, you're going to get called on it if you do. You know, so it's it's um, you know finding those common threads and those common bonds, uh, and really understanding what makes the team tick. And if you do that well, you can solve. You can do anything. You know, if you build an amazing team, you can literally do anything. So. Um, I think the last few years, you know, going to your question, have really prepared us for pretty much anything going forward. That was really tough. <laughs> I think we can all agree. Um, you know, unfortunately, we're we're starting to see the other side of it. Um, but I just feel that this experience really set us up for many, many challenges up ahead. So I think we'll be in really good shape. Andrew, if I could add to that, something um, I love everything you said, and I, I really agree with that. Um, Something I'd also challenge you to do is kind of dive deep, do a little deep dive of what your why is. You all have a why on why you're here, why you wake up in the morning, why you're doing the job that you're doing, why you work for the company that you're working for. Maybe it's to pay off student loan debt, maybe it's to buy a new house, maybe it's for your family, maybe it's to help a aging parent who should be retired. Everybody has a specific why. Um, during these really tough days that feel long or a customer turns us down or whatever the case might be, it's much easier to get on to that next day, that next call, that next customer meeting if you tap into your why and you should be telling your teammates and your, and your manager and your manager should be asking you if you're a leader, you should be asking your team, what is your why? And you gotta usually peel the onion back, well, I've got to okay, well, great. Now, why, why is that important? Like, well, they gotta go to school and I had to pay off $100,000 in student loan debt and I don't wanna do that, okay. Well, tell me how many kids, how, you know, what school do you think that they'll go to? How much do you have to pay? Like, what do you think this is gonna look like? And now, every time somebody's having a hard day, we can tap in to be like, okay, little Johnny's gonna need to go to NYU, he told me that, so we gotta make those 10 extra calls or go after that customer meeting. So, that'd be something else I think you can do personally or you should be talking to your leader about. Thank you, Jacqueline, uh, you teed it up for us, what's your why? <laughs> so I have a couple, thank you. Um, <laughs> so how has it changed since you, you know, from a 22 year old wandering the job fair to, to now? Yeah, I and mean, you're exactly right, it does change. So there was a time where I had $50,000 of student loan debt and I was trying to figure out how to pay that off. Um, and then it was a wedding, so my parents didn't give us a whole lot of money for a wedding. So then it was like, how do we collectively, you know, save enough for that? And then the first house, and now it's it's um, it's a couple things. So um, I do have the two kids, and so school and being able to be able to provide for them for that is going to be important. But they're small, so that feels really far. So it doesn't always tug at me the way that I think it needs to. Um, but I do have my real why is I have a mom that's about sixty five, and she still works, and it kind of breaks my heart. So like I want to help be able to make her life easier in addition to providing for my own family and that tends to tug at my heart more than you know thinking about school that's 15 years from now for my kids. Thank you. Thank you. And anything to add or? Um, I've gotten the why or yeah, on, uh, sorry. on the original question. We, on the original question. So on the original question um, you know being ten, purposeful and using an over um, to over rotate on intentional is the way to connect with people now, right? Like the, the COVID period has created this, you know, new net new world that we're all living in. And I think doing fun things like for a, 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 to, to bond the team together, you know, when the, when the COVID numbers are low, try to get people together, right? When the COVID numbers are not low and people are working remote, be creative. I mean, we've done a lot of things with like book clubs and, you know, if I do another online happy hour and mixing drinks in front of my <laughs> office and having to explain that to my children is not normal, but th those were normal at the time. So there was, those were appropriate too for, for building the, uh, the culture of the team. Um, so you have to you know, be over-rotate on intentionality and authenticity. I love that, thank you. The, the over-rotation, the, 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 the intentional focus on bringing people together. I also want to call something out that Hilarious to me. We've got our sales leaders on one side of the room, and our sales engineering leaders on the other. And I'm, I'm Jacqueline. I'm listening to you talk about your why, and like my why is like I just really love solving problems, <laughs> and the money will come if I do that really, really well. <laughs> so uh, thank you so much. Uh, we can move on to the next one, Andy. Uh, if, if you could, a lot of how we sell is as we we approach customers and talk about value and frameworks uh, and value frameworks, and we really pitch value. Uh, and, and during a recession, or, or what may become soon become a recession, 
How does that change? How do your value frameworks change? How do your pitches change? Or do they change? So if you're focused on your customer, your value metrics don't change, but your customer's lens on the value that you're positioning with them will change dramatically. And I think it's about being in touch with your customer and understanding even more than they do what their challenges are um, is to really be, um, the, to add the most value to them is to help them through this. So more often than not in these types of environments, the customer internally won't recognize that their ability to purchase something is now different. The metrics, the, the hurdle rates internally change, the weighted average cost of capital, well, all those financial things that they needed to use to get something done in one way will change dramatically because their CFO is trying to adjust for uh, economic downturn. So they won't come into that until after you're halfway down the, the line. So qualification up front and really focusing on what your customer needs and helping them, you know, not only your customer at large, like the voice of your customer, the individual that you're working with. Like how do you make that person successful? And to me, that's what sales is. It's really building personal relationships and making those individuals successful in their own careers and helping them to deliver, to be promotable and to get stuff done. So connecting those dots on their behalf and thinking about them and as if I was in their seat, what would I need, right? Challenge them a little earlier to, to go talk about what, what might have changed to now get a quote purchasing done, right? Jacqueline, I have to ask you the same question. You know, as you coach your sellers, you know, what has changed? You know, what, what, is, what are you telling them or asking them about how they approach your customers and how they pitch value? How has that changed? I'll keep this answer kind of short and sweet because I think you nailed it. I think getting beyond surface level pain, you've really got to get into the metrics, the the why now, what are the implications of doing nothing because projects may not have the same budget that they once were. There's going to be potentially a lot of unbudgeted projects that you need to go figure out how to get funded. So those metrics, those implications of doing nothing are really important. And then focusing more on um, the metrics that matter to them. So, so during a positive um, stock market time or financial time, it may be more focused on your digital transformation journey or um, up level and security. Those are more surface level, but at a high level, it's more about strategic projects. During this time, it might be more about how is how are those things going to very specifically save the co save the company money, do more with less, and so the, I really mirror exactly what Andrew said. Jen, anything to add? Before? I think you summed so Jacqueline, we'll keep you keep the mic in your hand and keep you on the hot seat. Um, and, and a similar question, so kind of further down the opportunity, you know, further a more mature opportunity, you get further like a, a later stage opportunity. How does deal strategy change? Yeah, so having a champion is going to be really huge. Having somebody that's got your back, that's behind you, um, that's coaching you behind closed doors to know what those metrics, those implications are how to get past some of these different stages. Getting access to the economic buyer is gonna probably be more important than ever because they're going to care about what projects are going to get prioritized since many of the projects may not have the same funding that they once did. Um, going back to having very specific metrics on ROI, financial case, um, how to get to mean time to resolution faster that's going to show a total cost of ownership or for them to do um, more with less. Um, but I just think you have to be a little bit more on your game, a little bit more customer obsessed to make sure that you're thinking through very specifically if anything has to happen, if it's the difference between them not doing a layoff and your project, why is your project, and that's a kind of a crappy example, but why is your project so important that it's going to do what it needs to do for that company, which is either increase revenue or reduce costs. And out to the, the cloud folks in the room, um, you know, Infrastructure is consumption. Right? There, there isn't really an option to walk away from a from a cloud company because your, your service shut down and your business dies. So, you know <laughs> when you, uh, it's, it's, uh, but so you know when when you're thinking about you're not in the middle of a deal, but you have a customer on your that's consuming that's already purchasing your product. How does your strategy for, for approaching those customers? How does that change? Authenticity. I think it comes down to being authentic. You know, someone told me a lot, oh, many moons ago, no one, and this is this applies to everyone, no one wakes up in the morning and says, gosh, I wonder what Jen is going to tell me today about cloud. Like, no one does that. 
You know, we hope that they do, but it doesn't. You know, so it has to be the right time, it has to be the right message, it has to be the right cost. Um, there's so many conflicting priorities on a daily basis, especially in a time of economic uncertainty, that you have to be very mindful of those kinds of things. Um, because otherwise, it just comes across as too heavy when they're like, oh, I don't have time for you today, Jen. You know, I'll, I'll see you in two weeks. Um, so authenticity and being very, very perceptive, right? Um, understanding hey, and, and helping them to see around the corners for um, you know, what's, what is coming down the pipe that they don't even realize yet. Um, so authenticity, help them see around corners, help them solve problems, and build trust. This, uh, our whole space is all around trust. And you know, the more that we can build that and reinforce that, sometimes you know, the deal sizes are going to ebb and flow because money ebbs and flows, right? There's going to be times where customers are more comfortable making a longer term commitment. Other times it's going to be, hey, I, I need to look one month at a time and being okay with that because with, when you do that well, you build trust and trust is what you know formulates that long-term relationship. Um, so let me frame this. So what, I've been with Amazon AWS for three years. In the first year I joined, I was assigned to build the territory that was supporting travel and hospitality accounts as well as financial services accounts. And I was to establish that travel and hospitality cluster. Um, 2022, we've gotten pure, and now I just focus on uh, financial services customers. But what I wanted to talk about was the experience that our travel and hospitality customers went through <coughs> during COVID the economic impact to them when their business was like on the edge of going out of business and not understanding how to navigate through an economic turn downturn like they were experiencing. Right? I think from the you know, 2020 hindsight kind of angle, we can say, oh, the downturn for them was only X number of quarters, right? And now there's all this pent up demand. But at that moment, those conversations were about spinning down, right, the, the power of cloud, not having overburdened OpEx kind of capacity that they built into a data center. It was about those servers that were being able to spin down and match the demand that they were meeting in the marketplace. And that was tremendously valuable for them. And what it did do was accelerate their adoption of cloud in the future. And the, the other thing is that any time an economic downturn happens and you're in an IT organization, the first thing that gets cut is innovation, which is the opposite of the way you want to survive. Right? If you're gonna be a smart leader, you're gonna be looking at how do I reemerge? Right? Let me study how this has happened in the past. How do we reemerge a stronger company? Right? So the, 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 the combing of you know, cutting heads and costs and vendors and all that has to be towards a strategic exit. So something at Amazon we do is we work backwards from our customers' kind of desired business. Our customers didn't know what they were working backwards from because they didn't really quite understand it. So to be more of an advisor to them and to help them to navigate through that was invaluable to them and they're forever indebted and you know really much stronger customers and bigger relationships and more um, more mature cloud businesses going forward too yeah I, I think uh, one of the themes I'm hearing from all of you is, is, is customer empathy is really important in, in deal strategy and at all customer interactions especially with Dr. Um, the other thing that I found a little comical Jen when you said that money ebbs and flows and anybody that's worked in sales long enough yeah. Knows <laughs> that very, very, very well. So, um, Jen, uh, moving on to the next question. Um, so, there's a lot of economic uncertainty right now, and your team is feeling it. That's me. <laughs> your team is feeling it. Our teams are feeling it. Um, do you relax? Do you relax work deadlines? Do you do you take things off their plate, or 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 do you keep going? What do we do? Keep going, keep going. <laughs> Noted for perf. No, just kidding. Um, so I love this. I love this concept, and I've experimented with it a, a couple of different ways. And here's my perspective. Um, in times of stress, when you have a team who has a lot of deadlines, and you know the manager is really trying to take care of the team, uh, you know, take care of the well-being, the emotional. Um, the career path, you know, keep everyone motivated and keep everyone moving forward. The natural inclination when we are facing adversity or facing stress or facing too much on our plates is as managers to take things off, right? But the inadvertent effect of that is that 
people are thinking then, okay, well, the, the team is now thinking, ah, oh, did I not do my job well enough, right? It, you kind of have the opposite effect. And so what I found is in times of stress, um, you, you don't want to push anyone to the, the breaking point naturally, and you have to be, remain very, very, very well connected, um, but resist that urge to pull things off to help. Because a lot of times that stress is actually kind of, is, is powerful and it unites a team. And you know, you can all think back, I, I can definitely do it, think back about that team that you worked with, that you, you moved mountains together. It was hard as all could be, right? But you moved mountains together and in a drop of a hat, you'd, you'd do another project with them. And that was really codified by the stress and the pressure and the excitement of doing something impossible or near impossible. So I don't personally, Joey, you'll keep me honest here. I, I really try not to pull back because I think it has the opposite effect. Um, you know, and, and building strong teams is, is very important. Uh, 100%. <laughs> <laughs> that was my own personal question. <laughs> <laughs> Andy or Jacqueline, I would love to hear from you, either of you on this, or both. I, I love what you said, and I think it was a tricky question, because at first you can almost think, do we take a step back? Do we give people more time with their families? You know, do we give people more time? And um, really the only person that can own those boundaries, I think, is the individual. At the end of the day, if you have to make the boundaries that are going to make you your best self, and that's making the time for the things that are most important so that you can bring your best self to work. Um, but while doing that, is, I'm sure there's a lot of things that drive you and excite you about your work, and those are, should be the things that you're probably asking to take on a little more of during these times so that you're energized and excited and working on the things that you're most passionate about. Everybody has things as part of their role that they may not love to do, and that's not going to go away but we can find small things that we can delegate if it makes sense um, based on other people's strengths. So I, I, I concur and I think that keeps teams together, it keeps people motivated, people wanna feel like they're doing meaningful work and that they're masters at that meaningful work while also making sure that we're not burning our people out, right? So it's easy during I think these Zoom days to work from seven to seven, eight to eight and just never kind of get to step away from that Zoom. So that is something to be mindful of that we're like forcing people like, hey, during our one-on-one, let's go do it during a walk, or let's do a group Peloton ride at 7 a.m. or something, go find some way to like stay connected and do things that aren't just so super work-related while not taking away from the things that people are most excited about from a work perspective. And real quick, Jacqueline, I think one of the things I love that you said about that is it's up to the individual to set their own boundaries, right? Um, and, and it's a manager's job to give you work until you say no more, right? It's a manager's job to push you. And, and it's all of our own responsibility to say, I'm full. I can't take anymore. Um, and, and why should that change in, in, in this? I think uh, what I'm, what I'm, and Jen, what I'm hearing from you is like, these are crucible moments. These, we, we learn more when in times of stress, we evolve more, we, we remember more uh, of the hard times than the good times. And, and, and I, you know, anybody that's ever worked on a product team that's ever had to ship software knows exactly what that feels like. That last month or two before you ship is the worst month or two and also the best month or two of your career. Anybody that's been in that position, that position stinks, it's hard. But then you look back on it fondly, and, and uh, so I really love that. So, and yeah, anything to add to this? So I'll, I'll look at it from the role of the sales engineer. So my favorite saying is sales is a team sport. Yeah. And if you're on the team and you're stressed and overworked, let's figure out who can flex and cover you on that team to, to make uh, you know things work for the customer and work for your role. The, uh, the other thing here is, if it's an economic downturn, like let's get to work so we can get us out of this economic downturn, right? Like the quicker we deliver better results for everybody in the country, and, you know, consumers feel more confident, then we're out of the econ you know the economic downturn. And these things do happen, right? They it's not are we in a, re a recession now or yet, right? It's when is the next recession going to happen because it will inevitably happen again. And how we handle that is still to be determined. But uh, you know, from a, from a team and a leadership perspective, I think it's really important that you're um, your own personal career development, if it's part of this downturn, is not tied to downturn means negative. Because you can have an extraordinarily successful career, a la what we were saying with the cloud and, and during COVID. Like you can 
your business can be thriving, right? You could be the disruptor that your product could be delivering the results that's gonna thrive during an economic downturn. So it just generically doesn't mean that it's a negative sentiment for everybody. Thanks, Dave. I uh, while you keep the mic. Sure, sure. And uh, we're gonna move on to the next question. And given that you are, you've been, you've been through more recessions than than the other most. Folks. So, uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, how is this different or similar from from what you've been through in the past? Or the dot com bubble, yeah. which you specifically mentioned, uh, two thousand eight financial crisis. How is this different? So, this is you know, so I deeply think about this stuff. So. Uh, Live, you know, work through three recessions, right? If you define it as like reduction in GDP or whether it's just an economic downturn or not. Um, this is very different. There's, let, let's talk about first in the dot-com bubble in the 2000, it was a corporate-led recession, right? Companies over-invested in infrastructure and services and it took time, it was a jobless recovery. And right? it was a very unique situation. In the housing crisis, the Great Recession, it was longer, like maybe 18 months on paper, but it felt like a couple of years for folks. The, the, the cause there was financial platforms, housing losses, and um, you know, if you were in New York and part of financial services, your customers' businesses were disrupted, right? Because they were too big to fail and they had to get bailed out. So they cut a lot of jobs. But this recession, if it's going to be one, will, um, we're in a very unique situation. So I did a little research. I looked at corporate balance sheets have $4 trillion of cash on them. Corporate profits are in double digits right now. So double digit profit margins, meaning like companies are better positioned now to handle a recession than they have been in any more recent post-World War II kind of I don't, I'm not old enough to remember World War II. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like in that economic period. Um, so in addition to that, you also have the highest um, 11 million unfilled jobs. So unemployment is at its lowest. Whereas in other times you see, you know, business downturns, unemployment raises up, right? So you, and then you have a very um, maybe over um, overfunded kind of consumer, right? So people still have debt and or equity in their homes, and the government flooded everybody with cash, you know, during COVID. So you're, you're in a very unique situation that we haven't seen in a very long time. So are companies going to ride it out, maybe not let people go? Maybe just, hey, we've got the profits, we've got the cash, let's not cut costs. Maybe they slow down hiring, which we're starting to hear. A lot of the tech companies, especially the financial services companies in New York have been suggesting a slowdown in hiring. By the way, Amazon and AWS still hiring, growing, you know. This time is gonna be different, and it's gonna be, um, it's going to be, you know, what pulls us and tips us over, who knows, but I think, you know, we, we could look at this differently and, I can, and have a better, you know, terra firma to stand on before we move forward in our careers because what we know is, is different this time. Yeah. But you bring up a really good point, like talking about the macroeconomic conditions around a recession. Not every recession is the same, and I'm thinking about, like, you know, the early 80s, the early mid 80s. I think my parents told me the interest rate on their first mortgage was 12% like 1982 or something like that. And so the, we're kind of in a similar place right now, like this uh, hyperinflation. So I guess we need somebody that's got about 20 more years who lived through their early yeah. to talk to us about that. Um, Jacqueline or Jen, and, anything to add to, to uh, Andy's front? Sure, so I think as sales engineers or customer engineers, we actually sit in a really, really interesting kind of pivot point. You know, we are the, the advocates for our customers. We help them to save money. We help them to solve problems. We help them to innovate when resources are thin. And that is a tremendous spot to be in. It is, it will always be valuable. It's super, super, super resilient. You know, and as you look around, like, you know, keep an eye on all of these things. It's very important, don't overextend yourself. Make sure you're in a good spot that you have line of sight to what your next five years is going to look like. Um, you know, but we're, we're in a really, really fortunate spot that the skills and the, the problem solving and the curiosity that we have as sales engineers is, is incredibly valuable, whether it's, you know, in, in any sort of economic position. So I think it's, it, every once in a while you have to kind of stop and say, actually, this is pretty cool. You know, it's a, it's a really spot to be, a cool spot to be in. So I just want to show that. 
to have that think uh, like one of the best pieces of advice I ever got is like you'll be fine as long as you get an engineering degree. <laughs> so, uh, just echo that. So I would love to throw the next one to you. Um, you know, we've got a lot of folks in the room who are uh, career switchers, or they're looking for new challenge, or looking to break into sales engineering. You know, what advice would you give to folks that are looking for a new role? Uh, you know, given everything that we're seeing going on in, in uh, the economy today. Yeah. What did they call this year? The, the year of the Great Resignation. So, tons of people have been making changes this year. Um, so a couple things, and uh, a few things had been said. Um, you talked about it earlier. You gotta raise your hand, you gotta let people know where you wanna be and where you wanna go. I think there's a, a little bit of this mindset that if I just do a really great job and I plug away, somebody's gonna tap me on the shoulder for that next gig. And unfortunately, that's not, you, everybody's moving too fast and that doesn't always happen. So you gotta make sure that people know where you wanna go and that's your manager, that's potentially to be networking with people either in your company or outside your company. Um, it could be a hiring manager for something that you want to do. Um, find connections. So I'm a big believer in networking. This everybody in this room is here, probably to network, and so you're taking you know the first five steps. So make sure at the happy hour you shake some hands, you meet some new people. That always goes a long way. It's kind of table stakes to be great at what you do. You want to showcase that you can do your job in excellence and with mastery. And wherever possible, go beyond the job description. Ask your leader or the people around you, what challenges are you facing? Where are you having a hard time? Maybe it's recruiting. Maybe it's you know a specific vertical that we just haven't been able to break into healthcare. We just can't do it. Like, Take on something that your leader or your ecosystem is being challenged with. Put a little cross-collaborative team together. It doesn't all have to be on you and brainstorm one or two simple ideas. Sometimes it does not have to be earth shattering. You don't have to be the next pioneer of a net new product, but just tweaking messaging or whatever the case might be. So getting beyond the job description, mastering your current role, networking is huge. Um, a small thing that's tactical, but if you are applying um, to roles, Really look at that job description and make sure you're customizing your resume to meet the very specific verbiage that is in their description because you will be surprised that if you don't have somebody that can hand that resume over, you might just be one of many people going through a computer system of analytics trying to find specific buzzwords. Um, so that's one and then of course where you can network and have somebody that can actually hand your resume to the, the hiring manager, that's always um, really important too. But those are a few things that I've kind of done over the years to progress my trajectory, and I think that applies to any type of role you're looking at. Andy, Jen, anything, any advice for, for job seekers? So um, if you are in a technical capacity that's not customer facing, I think you should take a moment and reflect on your career and even your personal life and your greater time as an adult and figure out where you have those opportunities to show that you have customer facing skills and lever up on that and develop a really concise story to help connect with what you don't have to what you may have enough of to get into that role. So you know being bold and having that like kind of learning mentality where you're going to continue to develop yourself is going to shine through if you're telling your story properly but also to to go over and above to you know don't don't just apply to jobs that you think you're ready for apply for jobs that you think you will be ready for so that you're you're going kind of up in that trajectory um, you know in sales you're focused forward almost always so whenever in your career you have an opportunity to pause stop and reflect and look back on the experiences that you have and really develop those stories so that you can help tell them efficiently to make your weaknesses not disappear but put the hiring manager at rest right so the days okay this person's never actually been in this role but they can do this right give make that connection This is such good advice. I hope everyone is like taking copious notes. Not really. uh, so I have three things here. So three things. One is your managers are amazing, or the people that you work with are amazing, but we're not mind readers. So be your advocate. Be your best advocate. Um, you know, state your intentions about where you want to be. I love that advice. I think we should all take that. Um, figure out the second piece is figure out what you want to be known for. What are your superpowers? You know, what do you want people to think? Oh, Jen, she does Bob. You know, um, so that's that's another piece. And then the third piece here is it's not bragging when it's based on facts. 
So we do, we do something here called I'm Remarkable, and it's all about the practice of self-promotion. And self-promotion, a lot of cases, can feel icky, right? We don't want to brag, right? That, that just feels, ugh, you know. But who is going to advocate for you on your behalf if it's not you, right? So it's not bragging when it's based on facts. So I, I love all of this advice. I just want to add those two. What do you call it? I remarkable. I am remarkable. I am remarkable. I like yeah. that. Just to kind of tie together a lot of the things that I'm hearing from, from the panelists, you know, I, I go back to Andy's uh, mentioning of intentionality, right? Uh, of being intentional. And, and Jacqueline, you gave a really good example of intentionality. It's like get deeper than the job description. Understand what it means. And Jen, you're talking about find your advocate, right? All those things are or related, like if you're trying to break into a company, you have to be intentional about it. You have to understand the roles, you have to understand the culture, right? You, it, the, the shotgun approach of just dropping 100 resumes at, at 100 different companies doesn't really work, right? You have to be intentional, and so you need to need to get behind the role, you need to develop that advocate, and you need to be intentional about it. And, and it, it's, it's a lot of work. Um, it, it really is a lot of work, it's, it's a full-time job. But uh, if, if you're looking to break into a new career, if you're looking to break into a new company, I think this intentionality, getting deeper than the job description, developing your advocates uh, at that company are really, really important. And then also if you're looking for a role internally, all that same, same advice still applies. So, um, so we'll probably just do, uh, so <laughs> just kind of silver linings for all of them, right? We, we work in technology. Right? And, and not all change, not all disruption is bad. Um, you know, it, it's unfortunate, but, but there's a yin and a yang to everything. Like, like somebody's loss might be my gain, right? So um, what are some of the silver linings that y'all are seeing in your business uh, and that you've experienced over the past couple of years with COVID and, and now kind of the, uh, what are you predicting for how things will change in the coming year or two, if this recession really does get as bad as everybody kind of feels like it will. Um, so I'll, I'll do personal and professional. So on the personal side, um, though painful to be behind Zoom almost all day for like the last two <laughs> years, um, it has allowed me to be much more engaged and involved in my kid's life um, than I was able to do when I was having to commute or travel a lot more. So that's clearly a silver lining. Um, though lacking the last six months, there was a time where I was much more diligent from what, because of working from home on like my own health and wellness. So I gotta get back on track on that after the summer, I think. Um, those are a couple of things on the personal side. I think um, with the great resignation, it also gives people an opportunity to take a step back and ask themselves, what do I really wanna do? And what is really important to me? Um, so I think that's been a silver lining. And on the professional side, in tech, I think we are really fortunate. Um, though a lot of the tech stocks right now are down, so that feels a little ucky. Um, generally speaking, what we do, every one of our companies is a cloud company. I'm a cloud native security company, whether it's a cloud provider. I mean, those are the companies right now, we don't have shipping issues, we don't have supply chain issues. Um, we are helping clients with innovation and agility and getting to market faster and reducing costs. Like, what we do matters more than ever at this time during a recession and good times and bad. There's a lot of other companies that can't say that. So um, I think a silver lining is each of these companies um, and being in tech that we work for and what we can do for people and companies during this time. So uh, I'll add on from a silver lining perspective, right? Clearly from the technology industry, the customer's adoption of cloud and more advanced services that was, you know, uh, I don't know how many technology generations or trunker waves or whatever we measure uh, those movement forwards, it's, it's been an accelerator. Um, but looking at that and no, looking at, you know, I want to make a point about people in this career position. Like, because an economic change is going to happen, it's more important to self survey the company that you work for and what your product means in the new economy the next economy, whether it's this current trajectory of where we're bobbling or when we, if and when we do go into that next business downturn, like what does your company have? And then also if you're making career transition and you're looking at other organizations, where does that other company sit? In the, are they a disruptor or are they being disrupted? 
And if you're feeling like you're working in a disrupted space and you're, where your curse customers are being disrupted, you're gonna have to flex to change, right? So but be intentional and use all those things in that context. Um, but from a silver lining, I think just connections on people. So for existing relationships, it was easier to kind of expand during the Zoom day eras of connections. But for people who had to pick up new customers during this you know, COVID period, it was really hard. And, and what I saw change was the value of building relationships based on helping people more than selling people. And, and that, um, that customer obsession, we say at Amazon, but more, more so from a salesperson making that individual you're working with successful really shined as an accelerator to help people and, and to make things happen in a much shorter period of time. For me, the silver lining is really the dynamic aspect of being a, a customer engineer. I, I was uh, taking a look, you know, just at, at history and all of that a few a few months ago, and, and I was looking at all of the different customers that I've worked with. You know, very many different industries, different types of solutions, small, large, you name it. We solve problems, and that skill set as an engineer is incredibly valuable and resilient, regardless of what headwinds we face. Um, you know, so the, the, the silver lining for me is, I know that our skills are extremely transferable and extremely resilient. And you know, it's keeping those kinds of things in mind when we hear a lot of, of, of funk in the news. You know, it's like, okay, no, keep our why, you know, keep our why and, and why we're doing this on a daily basis. Keep that in mind and know and trust that the skills that we bring to our organizations and that, that we serve our customers with are, are enduring. You know, and keeping all of that in mind is, is for me, that's the silver lining. Jen, I, I think that's a great point. It's like, when the world feels, like, nothing is ever as good as it seems and nothing is ever as bad as it seems, right? And you, you and I were talking about, you know, uh, you know, back in March of 2020, when, when COVID first hit, like, I remember, like, for two or three weeks where I was just like, oh my God, this business is great. <laughs> like we are hosts and then like a week later every customer starts calling is like i've got ten thousand or fifty thousand or hundred thousand employees that are working remotely and i need some serious it so i can connect with all of them i need software i need security uh, and it actually turned to be an amazing amazing boon to our business so i think like just you know trying to maintain an even keel like maintaining your why sticking to what makes you tick sticking to you know what you're doing this for and controlling with controls is great advice and, and um, so yeah we'll see what the next couple of years brings but yeah. can't be any more wild than the last couple of years <laughs> um, so thank you so much to the audience so I'm gonna float with a mic um, Hi guys, thank you for joining us. Uh, following up on what Joe just kind of said, oh, sorry, can you guys hear? Oh, sorry. So just following up on what Joe kind of said in terms of you know 2020, you know things are going down. You guys are facing customers right now. What are your customers telling you now? Right? Um, yes, it's not that bad, but what? What, you guys are in front of the customer. What are they telling you right now? Okay. I can, I can, I'm so, having to take that. Right. Did you say you want to take it? Yeah, I'll do it. Yeah. Sorry, I only got one microphone. <laughs> yeah. So I, I think, um, and I'm really curious to see what, uh, what, my, um, what the panelists up here have to say, but for me, because I cover predominantly venture-backed startups in New York City, so it, it really depends on the company, right? So when you're covering venture-backed startups, like every single founder just saw uh, fundraising get infinitely harder and everybody's holding on to cash much, much more tightly, right? So, so kind of longer term deals, uh, you, you're seeing a lot of folks back away from those is like, how do I conserve cash? How do I maintain flexibility? I've got X number of dollars in the bank and, and how do I make that last as long as possible? Because it's really, really expensive uh, or really, really difficult for me to go out and raise more cash now. So there was this like, you know, very, very uh, kind of boom of, of venture investment over the past couple of years that is that is uh, tightened really, really quickly. So my customers, that's what's top of mind for them. 
And that's what they're really thinking about. How do I maintain flexibility? How do I lower burn? How do I extend my runway so I can get through whatever this is so, uh, so I can get to be profitability or, or whatever the next round is. But for the, for the enterprise leaders in the room, and Jen, you're in the same space as me, I'd love, love to hear what you guys have to say. Sure. So I think the, because the enterprise customers are already on a journey to the cloud, so to speak, right? They're either accelerating or slowing down or maintaining the speeds. The, the, the dependency of their industry is dictating, I think, how they're reacting. And then I'll even go further to say the sub-industry. So if I say financial services, I could say that I see hedge funds doubling down and doing something totally different than large investment banks or corporate banks who are now going into those freeze moments where they're like, how do I do more with less? Hiring freezes have started. I don't have the budget for that. Um, you know, the creativity uh, is where the sales team actually shines, is helping the customer to continue on that journey despite the objective or the hurdle that was put in front of them. And helping them to navigate through that is what is what separates kind of the, the cream rises to the top in these kind of determined uh, downturns. And I think that the, um, you know, the, the reception of the creativity is still there, right? So there is not as much doom and gloom, even in the customers who have already froze their budgets and stopped hiring, like they're still looking at how I can change things. You know, they know that their wallet share of like what their spend is might shift, so they're looking at taking, you know, maybe I was buying licenses from this place, I'm gonna shift that to, uh, you know, consulting and, and services in the cloud. Right? So it's that, but it's that level of creativity that I think is, um, is a good signal for corporates still pushing forward. I'll just make it really quick. I think it also depends on how the customer has done for the last two years. So some mm -hmm. customers had COVID was a blessing for them and they actually did really well and you know, it, it, was, a, it was a positive business experience for them. And some, you're talking about travel and um, hospitality, that was clearly an industry that was hit really hard. So I think it also depends, like travel and hospitality, everybody's booming right now. Everybody wants to get the heck out of their house and go travel. And so though there are some industries, I, I, my business is diversified with all industries. So I, I think I see a, a wide range of how clients are feeling, but the ones that, have been hit hard the last couple of years are probably coming out feeling really strong and doing well. The, the recession was more the last couple of years than now versus um, some that have really boomed. I can think of a particular um, client that all they did was send, I don't wanna say the logo, but they, they sent things to people's homes and when we couldn't be together and we couldn't celebrate together, that type of gesture went a long way. Well, that's starting to you know, even out now. So a long-winded way of saying, I, I do think we're seeing differences based on industry, specific customers, and like how they're doing, but I wouldn't say I'm gen generally feeling a rut yet of any sort, and that could also be because of the technology and what we provide for clients, and that it's still, still such a demand. Um, but I, I haven't seen it yet, you know, fingers crossed. Okay, so, um, so uh, Akshat, who rose the hardest, uh, has just informed me that, that we are done with questions. But before we dismiss our panelists, I wanted to uh, just thank you, thank you so much for showing up and, and being authentic and being honest. And everybody give them a big round of applause. Then we'll get to the after party. Joe, it sounds like you still have a job. I like how you slipped that question in. Jen, thank you for not firing Joe so you can put this all together. Jacqueline, I love just understanding the why behind, why we're all here, that was amazing. Um, and Andrew gave such an eloquent breakdown of the economic times we're in. <laughs> so we have nothing left to do but go party at Jungle Bird. So we're gonna mobilize this crew. We're gonna get over its eighth and 18th. 18th. Between 18th and 19th. Uh, 730 to 930, open bar, free food, free drinks, most importantly, networking. Uh, now, no better time than now to network. Got to be able to walk up the stairs. All right, well, thank you all for coming. We're going to all mobilize. Thank you so much to the panelists. Thank you, Jacqueline, Jen, Joe.